So that's the end of my speech. It's short because I thought I'd answer some questions if anyone had one about uh, had some about the party. But um, if so, please uh, please uh, feel free to ask. Go ahead. How okay? So you know what Francis Fukuyama said. Yes. Okay. How one of the reasons that H plus was branded was to try and get away from that. How are you going to address that in your campaign? How are you going to address Francis? Yeah. Well, one of the fo most important. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. His comment was transhumanist. Transhumanism is one of the most dangerous ideas on this earth. Yeah. Trans know. Transhumanism oh, is one yeah. of, is the most dangerous idea on the planet. And um, yes, and, and he has a point because I think more people agree with him than disagree with him. And um, so one of the things we've been trying to do, especially at the party, and with a at least with a lot of my articles, is trying to say. Transhumanism, and this is one of the reasons why everyone has probably seen the shift. I used to write pretty hardcore atheist articles. All of a sudden, Zoltan's <laughs> writing a lot more pro-religious articles. And part of the reason I'm doing that is because I am really trying to reach out to a much wider audience and say, okay, um, we don't have to have anti-robot demonstrations. We don't have to have the New York Times running an article yesterday saying scientists need to uh, you know, outlaw or put a moratorium on genetic research. What we need is a bunch of people up front saying, let's discuss this openly, ethically, and let's, let's attack the issue way before it happens. And if we can do that, because transhumanism has grown and broadened itself out to be not this crazy uh, group of mad scientists, but instead this, this group of intellectuals, uh, engineers, uh, you know, researchers that actually just want to make the human being better and live longer, then all of a sudden, they might say, well, yeah, let's work with them. Let's talk with them. Let's see what kind of new policies we can come out. And then we can avoid, in fact, we can avoid the entire conflict that uh, that's happens in the first part of my book. If you don't know that conflict, the conflict is essentially the protagonist, uh, Jethro Knights, is put in this environment of a very anti-transhumanist environment. It, it would be like, imagine if, if Sarah Palin or something had been uh, elected in or something like that. All of a sudden, you might have a very rigid America. America where not only stem cells um, become, you know, something illegal or something like that, but you have many technologies. They would say, you know, no to telepathy, no to artificial intelligence, no to anything that except is the most basic of healthcare. They could, uh, they could stagnate the country literally overnight if you have, were able to get in a bunch of policies like that. Um, and that's why it's very important that we have the conversation before people try to start the conflict itself. Because if we can avoid this conflict between transhumanists and conservatives or transhumanists and anyone else that opposes it, we're probably going to find ourselves in a, a much better negotiating position where we can actually make that change. Maria. Um, so what are you doing to raise funds for your campaign? So this is the most challenging part of the uh, campaign so far. Um, I am just literally launching my own presidential campaign this month, but the party, I've been working mostly on the party the last six months. Um, I have a Kickstarter campaign coming up in a few weeks. I think it's everyone's going to hear about it because it's the craziest idea anyone has probably put forth. Um, unfortunately, I can't say it yet, but uh, I'm hoping it will uh, it will be something unique and good. Um, and I'm sort of basing a lot of the transhumanist party on uh, this this thing. I'm hopefully going to have a scheduled bus tour going places around the country, at least the West and East Coasts, where I will be talking to universities, doing a bunch of meetups. We have just recently signed on a communications manager, and he's going to be organizing all these different things. So there are some incredible things happening. But regarding funding, we've had virtually no donations. I've been doing it mostly from my pocket, and it's been incredibly tough. My wife is getting very upset. Um, <laughs> but we're starting to reach out to some different types of people. Uh, you know, building the infrastructure of a political party has been very difficult. In addition to being a father, I have a one-year-old infant. And I also uh, have businesses to run that are separate than my uh, work with transhumanism. So it's always been very time constraining and all. It's also been pretty, it's doing 100 hour weeks and you can see the gray hairs appearing. You didn't see them last year. So they're, they're, they're already happening. But I'm hoping some of the new methodologies uh, are going to change the fundraising. We're gonna be getting a professional fundraiser on board and I'm interviewing two or three of them right now. And I'm hoping that they will be able to bring in something more for the campaign. Um, if that doesn't happen, though, then we're going to look for other alternative methods, uh, Kickstarter type things uh, that don't necessarily conflict with the running of a, an actual presidential campaign. And, uh, and also just um, more people doing volunteer work. Everyone right now is on a volunteer basis. So which of the transhumanist values 
that your party will be espousing, can you tell at this point would be easily incorporatable into A, the Dems message for 2016, and B, the reps message for 2016? Sure, well, I think the most important one that I've come out on recently, and I think, I think a lot of the community appreciated this, um, was uh, I do favor the universal basic income. I'm not cheerleading it all the way across the board, but I do see it as something very important as robots start taking all the jobs. And I think it's something that I would be surprised if the candidates address directly this election, but they're going to have to by next election. And they're gonna at least have to tackle it because what's happening is, um, you know, within five or 10 years, a huge amount of jobs are going to become automated. And I think much more than people realize and um, so we either need to stop progress or, or, or start giving people money and say you don't have to work. The other thing I've come out on um, is saying that I really believe in free education. I also believe in free college. It doesn't mean you can't have paid colleges, but I do believe we should be able to send everyone to college if they want to go. This is really important because our lifespans are getting longer. If people are gonna be routinely living to 150, why should our education level stop at high school? That's most. Most states in America have it stopping at age 17 or age 18, that's the legal limit. But I think we should encourage people to go all the way through college and higher and put it on the bill, uh, sort of like Europe does. I just feel like from a, from a humanitarian point of view, education is one thing, doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat, you basically support. So I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, these kind of policies will also stick. I think one of the other policies that we're, uh, you know, we're working on is this idea that the, you know, I want to take a huge amount of money from defense and put it directly into life extension. That is my number one goal. And, uh, and I've said this before. I believe that with one trillion dollars within hopefully 10 years, now I know a lot of experts think this is very optimistic, but I'll say it anyways because I don't mind being wrong if, it, if something like this was to happen, is that with $1 trillion, we could literally come to the very cusp or to the very edge of our mortality and, and stop it. And I think if we put that into research, we've got some kind of massive organization, massive international coalition working on a single thing. Uh, we change the culture of death in America and around the world, and we get people working on it. And we just dedicate a little bit of our money. I mean, we spent $6 trillion, I believe, on Iraq. So we can take $1 trillion and put it in directly into the life extension industry. We can spread it across universities. We can spread it across pharmaceutical companies. We can spread it across um, laboratories. And we can change the dynamics of health in this country if we would just get a politician to stand up and say, this is the right thing to do. Perhaps you can just tax it and send it to like work for some of these companies that are already in the... We could do all sorts of things. Whatever we do, though, it's incredibly important that we... we we kind of push forth and put these ideas out to these other people and say, you know what, the def and I think this is one of my main things too, is that the defense industry, I understand, you can't stop the defense industry in America because then you stop America. Fine, but what if we transferred the defense industry into some type of science <coughs> industry? What if we made it more life extension oriented? Then no one loses their job and it's still the money is spent on it. I realize the transition is incredibly difficult, but these are the kind of things that I'm trying to say as some of the main goals so that people listen. There are also different ideas, so hopefully you know, you'll have people saying, oh, well, that's interesting, let's think about that for a while. Now, you have to understand, you can't just go out there and say something, nothing happens overnight in the political world. I've, I've learned that, I think, already the hard way. But I do believe by saying these things again and again, and by shooting them out there and forcing major media to accept them as, we, as being said, it's going to help other politicians say, well, yeah, or other you know, strategy advisors say, yeah, I heard that. Maybe we need to think about that a little bit more. And that's a foot in the door. A foot in the door is all we need for the life extension industry. Peter. Well, good to see you, though, by the way. But um, I'm super happy to hear this talk because it clarifies a lot of things in my mind about what you're trying to do. But uh, one thing that concerns me a little bit is that... Uh, as you mentioned, these aren't really the front issues in this upcoming election. And what, what could happen, or might happen, is that one of those front issues is going to come to your doorstep. I don't know what it would be, but uh, you mentioned like defense. Uh, right now we've got some things happening in Europe, right? Uh, you know, I'm not going to take sides. That's not my point. My point is, it's a hot political issue. Uh, and it'd be, it, as a presidential candidate, you're going to be asked to comment on things like uh, 
relationship in Ukraine uh, and our relationship with Russia. Uh, here, uh, Korea is here from Russia. I mean, we're friends uh, together. We ignore all that. But when you're a presidential candidate, you no longer can. Uh, because, I mean, you say you're not going to win, but you're going to try to win, right? You're gonna, you know, I am 100% you know, so, committed to it. Right. So <laughs> someone's going to ask you that question. What about Ukraine? Someone's going to ask you, what about TPP? What about um, any, you know, what about uh, illegal aliens in the United States and the border? You know, border control. What about Department of Homeland Security that's been in place with a huge uh, monetary boom uh, to some of us? Uh, you know, so people are going to ask you about those things instead of life extension or uh, you know, reducing FDA regulation. And you're going to have to answer about the Ukraine, uh, even though that's not your hot issue. So, how? Uh, I guess my question is: On one hand, I'm super happy to hear you said you clarified it, but I'm I now have this worry that they're going to, if they're successful, you're going to be targeted. So. No, and I agree, and I am studying up on all these issues. One of the main positions of the transhumanist party is to be as centric as possible. One reason I chose to go down this path, you know, despite some of my libertarian leaning, which I've at this point basically left behind almost entirely, is that it was uniting for the various factions in the, in the movement. And I thought that was better as we were just getting uh, started. But you know, Peter, you have a great point, and I'm not an expert on all these topics, and I don't have an advisory board that can help. So, so far, when I've been confronting major media, and I have been confronting some, I've tried to explain to them that you know, I don't know enough at this moment, but we take very centric values, we protect in a very humanitarian way, and you know, I, I, would, I would kind of go the way I normally would, which is more liberal leaning, how can we protect people, how can we help people, and where can <laughs> science and technology play uh, a part. Um, if I was ever to get onto some of the bigger uh, shows, which might be happening, because I've been contacted, you know, Colbert Report, some of these other things, yeah. they're going to ask them questions, and I'm going to study. I don't have all the answers right now. I was recently asked about the ISIS, you know, and I, I thought, that's incredibly challenging. I, the transhumanist movement, I'm not even really aware of has one, except let's use technology to help ourselves. But we haven't actually thought through the specifics. So it's something that I am working on right now, um, and I'm trying my best to deflect many of those questions, to just keep it to what transhumanism is about. By 2020, 2024, and some other hopefully candidates that are going to be running on the transhumanist party, they're going to be working on other policies that are hopefully broader and will address those specifics. I'm not pretending to try to either put forth my own ideas or that I'm an expert on those things. And I hope the media that looks at me says, hey, you know, he, I understand what he's doing. He's probably not going to win, so he doesn't need to be an expert right now. He doesn't have a full terrorism team lined up. So, thank you. Sure. Why are parties this thing a super PAC? Uh, can you compare the effectiveness? Sure. Well, um, I thought from a, a political point of view, a party <clears throat> carried more impact. I am hoping that other people will develop a super PAC, though, that is supportive of the same things. I actually think a super PAC for some type of life extension industry would be is something that we really should do anyways and push for some of these other ideas. Um, one thing that will be happening is I have a, a couple different candidates that are interested in running for local government under the transhumanist party. Um, and uh, again, who knows whether they'll win, but actually two of them are, uh, are pretty well-known people, entrepreneurs that have some money of their own to, to put towards their local <coughs> campaigns. So I'm hoping that you know, they will also be working on things like that so that we can make this a bigger thing than it actually is. Um, but again, I, I must say I'm so overwhelmed right now with all that is going on um, that I wouldn't even have time to begin looking into, into exactly how that is. But I encourage anyone in this room, if they want to do it, or if they want to start a transhumanist party in, in some foreign land, because we now have 24 or 25 transhumanist parties, uh, please do it. Because the more, the better. I think the more people hear the name transhumanism and hear it associated with politics, we'll get other people uh, mm -hmm. discussing it. Uh, where do I sign up to become the party's uh, constitutional advisor? <laughs> <laughs> well, cur currently, we, we, ended, we ended up going with no actual um, joining of the party, and at least not this time around. Um, one of the reasons was that when we actually put forth this idea that people can join and pay an annual fee, there just wasn't enough memberships, and it was, it's difficult to go out there and for all of us to go door to door and get it. Now, you know, we, we have all the, many people in our community, which is 10, 20, 30,000, at least nearby, 
But it, it's not enough to do that in order to make a national dent. So what we've chosen to do is just to have it so that you don't need to become a part of the party. You can still vote some other way, but you can support the party. I think as, as we get more funding, as other things happen, and especially if the presidential campaign sort of works and reaches a, a broader audience, we'll then have show up on some state ballots and some stuff like that, and it will make sense to have more people join. But regarding advisors, you know, we're very selectively going through it right now, and we've chosen a, a few, but I think in over the next yeah, few weeks, there's going to be a couple more, but definitely send me an email. What advisory positions have already been filled? Um, so, we have Aubrey de Grey as an anti-aging advisor. We have Maria as the longevity advisor. Natasha Guidemore is the human enhancement advisor. It's probably going to be that term. It might be transhumanism advisor. We have Gabriel Rothblatt, who is the, my political advisor. And I was, uh, I was very, I was thinking about having Gabriel as the uh, vice president. We had discussed it. I don't know if you know Gabriel Rothblatt, but he's Martin Rothblatt's son. And um, I was thinking it'd be great to have him. Unfortunately, he is too young. Uh, you have to be 35 years of age to uh, to either be a vice president or a a presidential candidate, um, and uh, so he's one of our advisors. And um, we have Jose Cordero. He's uh, a Singular University professor. He's the technology advisor. We have um, Giovanni. Uh, the, who's the uh, the founder of scientific transhumanism? His Stasi. Yes, he, yeah. he he is he is now the um, the neuroscience advisor. So we're trying to piece together a great team. And what I'm really trying to do, we have Grace Scott as our futurist advisor. What I'm really Rich trying to do, Lee too. oh, we have Rich Lee as our, bi our biohacker uh, advisor, who's great because he's, he's pretty well known. What I'm trying to do is feed everybody press, feed everybody media, and that way they can take it and advise as they feel fit because they're all sort of leaders in their field. And I'm, I'm believing that this is kind of not only good for the movement and good for the party, but it's also just good for everyone else because it does seem that the party, political party in itself is somewhat worthy of news attention because we are, you know, we are suggesting some uh, some controversial ideas that actually could be impactful in the overall uh, game of things uh, concerning the transhumanism uh, movement. So, um, I think one final question, if anybody has one. There, back way back. Go ahead, back. Go ahead. Mikhail kind of talked about using drama to get attention, and that seems a little bit radical compared to your approach. So, I was wondering if you could kind of reflect on if you have any concerns towards so I do believe drama can be used very effectively. Uh, I am, in my own sense, trying to pull back from actually being more dramatic than I am because I, I do, <laughs> I, I have always subscribed to revolutionary tendencies. That said, um, you know, there's a balance. I definitely encourage other people in the community to use. Uh, drama and to use some of the actions I've actually spoken with them about some of their plans and I think they're fantastic. Um, it, it's, I, do would, I would associate the party with it to some degree. I'm not sure personally how much I can do it. It would kind of be a balance of how media is going to handle it. But certainly I think activism is going to be one of the big keys moving forward, especially if we continue to have um, some type of demonstration or some type of um, anti-transhumanist message that is you know, so you, you're starting to see it every week or so. You hear something that's sort of anti-transhumanist. It's a little bit scary. And when the New York Times starts running articles on that, then you're like, whoa, this is really getting a little bit bigger. So I believe that one way to counter that is through activism. But there also needs to be another side of the party and another side of the movement that ultimately is, is kind of a pacifist and says, no, you know, we take this. We'll work within you. We'll, we'll, we'll work with whatever problems you have. And so that way, you know, we approach it from a holistic point of view. But um, I am a radical myself, and I subscribe to those ideas. So uh, you'll probably see some drama uh, things happening uh, in order to keep uh, keep the message alive, and in order to, to get the media interested in covering transhumanism.